Released in 2002 with a price tag of 1,999 US dollars, the D100 was the first consumer level DSLR from Nikon, acting as the baby brother to the successful pro level D1 and a direct competitor to Canon's D60. Budget minded photo enthusiasts could now join the digital revolution. The body design is based on the F80, a 35 millimeter film camera released two years prior. You would think that it would more closely resemble the F100, but camera model names are just one of those things that exist beyond the edge of rational thought. In 2004, Nikon followed up the D100 with two similar models, splitting their consumer range into the entry-level D70 and the D200, acting as a step up from that. The D100 features a 6.1 megapixel APS-C, or DX in Nikon speak, CCD sensor. ISO from 200 to 1600, F-mount with full support for AFD lenses, a built-in flash, top LCD status display with a green LED side light. For storage, it uses compact flash, supporting cards up to 4 gigabytes, USB 1.1 via a mini connector. You're best off using a card reader to transfer your photos though. There's also a composite video out mini jack and power in. It uses ENEL3 type batteries a very tiny, by today's standards, 1.8 inch TFT LCD. It isn't exactly high res at 150,000 pixels, and the viewing angles aren't very good. Okay, being a digital camera body from 2002, there's obviously only so much you can expect from it. Now I think with contemporary cameras, in most use cases, shooting JPEG is fine. There's a lot of information there, and the workflow is just easier for everyday photography. In the case of the D100, I recommend shooting RAW at all times. Its resolution, dynamic range, and noisiness doesn't give a whole lot to work with. You'll want to start with as much as you can get and massage the image when developing those RAW files. That said, there are limits as to what you can massage from it. Pump up that detail and put that noise on display. You want a vintage film-like image? This camera will deliver something akin to that. Lean into its shortcomings. Even when shooting RAW, there are some artifacts to deal with. With chroma noise in dark areas and a bit of zippering on high contrast edges. These older CCD censored cameras have been getting somewhat popular lately for the way that they capture color. I'm not going to say that it does something that a newer CMOS sensor necessarily doesn't, but it can give you quite vibrant colors with a slide film look to them. As I said at the top of this video, the D100 is based on the F80, and it kind of shows. When using it, you do get a sense that this is a digital camera grafted onto a film body. For example, the shooting mode dial is also how you can access ISO, white balance, image quality, and AF target. Note, these can be adjusted through the rear menu as well. This double duty just seems kind of clunky. The interface often requires using two hands at a time. To zoom in, you must hold down a button while turning the rear wheel control. It's needlessly fussy. There is an overall sluggishness to how it performs. In my 5D classic video, I stated that I was surprised as to how snappy everything felt. And that's because I expected it to perform a little more like this. That said, the difference between that camera and this one is three years and several thousand dollars. One area where this camera performs quite well is power consumption. It just seems to keep going. Especially when you have the battery grip as I do. This accessory not only provides double the power and a second set of controls for shooting portrait, it also adds a remote port. So if you want to plug in an intervalometer to do time-lapse, the grip is a necessity. Something I've noticed about Nikon's SLRs is that they put a lot of attention into dampening the mirror slap. There is absolutely no kickback when you fire the shutter on the D100. It feels really contained. When it comes to cleaning the sensor, from what I can tell, mirror lock is only available if the camera is being powered by an AC adapter. Without one, things get a little adventurous, as you have to set it to bulb and hold down the shutter while rooting around in there. 
Ultimately, it all feels maybe a bit half-baked. And fair enough. This is about as early as you can get into DSLRs without getting into some real exotic territory. I've talked about the overall level of compatibility when it comes to the Nikon F mount in the past. With over 60 years of cameras and lenses based on this platform, there's a high level of interoperability between all of them, but it has its limits. When it comes to lens support, the D100 seems to draw its comfort line at AFD. Unlike later consumer models, it does also have its own autofocus motor and will work with screw-driven AFD lenses. I only have one such lens myself and I found the performance to be, well, worse than my F4. Now this could be the fault of my particular copy, but my gut tells me that this is not an autofocus beast under the best conditions. Anything before AFD, you are only able to shoot in full manual mode, giving you an error code if you try firing the shutter in any other shooting mode. It does support the auto aperture, but it doesn't have an AI tab, so it doesn't know what the aperture is set to. Which unfortunately means that you don't have access to the light meter. This kind of sucks if you want to use older glass, as you have to essentially figure out your exposure with test shots. That said, you get used to it pretty quick. This camera is old. There are people born after its release that can vote. So your expectations must take that into account. With patience and tweaking, it can take some interesting images. And for some, this might be a great tool in their artistic arsenal. The D100 doesn't feel cheap or cumbersome, but it also doesn't feel as refined and confident as later models. Most people getting into classic DSLRs might want a little more than what this camera has to offer in both image quality and functionality. So something more fully realized like the D200 might be a better option. Mm -hmm. 